This is the Self Storage Podcast, where we share the knowledge and skills from the industry's leading investors, developers, and operators to help you launch and grow your self storage business. I'm your host, Scott Myers, and over the past 16 years, we have acquired, developed, converted, and syndicated over 2 million square feet of self storage nationwide with the help of my incredible team at selfstorageinvesting.com, who has helped thousands of people achieve greatness in self storage. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Self Storage Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Myers, and this week's guest is Josh Cantwell. Josh is a husband and father to three amazing children and is also a pancreatic cancer survivor. And we're going to spend a little bit of time in this interview talking about that and the lessons he learned in life and in business through that. He and I have known each other for over 15 years, and I have watched him graduate from single family fix and flips to now managing over $40 million in private equity which is deployed into multifamily real estate and self-storage. He has been involved in a 1,000 plus wholesale, rehab, rental foreclosure, and apartment transactions, and currently holds a portfolio of over 3,000 plus cash flowing properties. His superpower is sticking to his nine fundamental disciplines that he shares with everyone who will listen that have allowed him to scale and grow a wildly successful real estate investing business. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with my friend, Josh Cantwell. Well, Josh, so good to have you back on the show. It's uh, been a minute since uh, we had an opportunity to be in the same room or in the same Zoom room together. And we've been watching each other's uh, journey and uh, glad that we were able to get on here and giving everybody a little bit of your bio and a little bit of your background. But uh, if you would, why don't you catch Storage Nation up on what you've been doing recently and um, talk a little bit more about uh, really about the private equity side and how you've really grown that side of the business. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, the Storage Nation is uh, something I'm very familiar with. Scott and I did our first kind of speaking engagements together and things maybe, geez, 15 years ago on the same stages. And back then I was in residential. I was, was a national speaker. We were flipping hundreds of houses a year. And what happened, Scott, was in 2011, just really briefly, I was out of nowhere diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and realized when I was kind of ripped away from my business for nine months getting ready for that surgery and then recovering from the surgery, I realized I'd made a massive mistake, which was I did not invest for cash flow. And so I've completely changed what I did coming out of that surgery in 2011, 2012, really started focusing on what I thought my superpower was, which was raising money. And back then we were really using it and deploying that into buying lots of residential properties. That grew to the point where I didn't need any more money for my own deals. And my team and I decided to start a private equity fund back in 2014 and kind of recruit the money into a fund structure. And there we were doing a lot of lending. We were doing a lot of private money lending, a lot of hard money lending. We actually started brokering for other fund sources. We started funding some self-storage. We started funding some small and medium-sized apartments, a lot of fix and flips on Resi. And then from there, our investors that really loved the returns and loved what we were doing, they started saying, hey, Josh, what else do you have? And uh, you know, starting in about 2017, 2018, I started really partnering up with some friends of mine that were already in the multifamily space and some guys that were in the self-storage space and really started to kind of joint venture with them. Because my superpower has always been, Scott, regardless of whether it was residential, a fund, whether it was multifamily, self-storage, it was always raising money. My, that was my superpower. So we just started, started to direct those dollars into these new opportunities. And then really for the last four or five years or so, We've really exclusively focused on multifamily, about large apartments. And then when COVID hit, our strategy even became more narrow, which is one of the things I want to talk about today, if we can, about being a super niche investor, but became even more narrow, not only raising money and focusing on multifamily, but really focusing in on a couple markets that I wanted to absolutely have a foothold on. I was not going to be spread out all over the country. So as I've learned and grown up, you and I have kind of grown up in this business together, right? You have a very similar path, but one in multifamily, one in self-storage. You realize that being super niche is where it's at. And that's really helped me a lot to you know have the reputation I have in my markets with brokers and with, with lenders and with private investors. So that's a little bit about the journey I've been on for the past you know, 10 or 15 years. And that's really where I wanted to spend the rest of our time is on focus because, you know, Josh, you've done an incredible job of that. Um, we as entrepreneurs and as real estate investors, but we can get shiny objectitis. And, you know, many times that does uh, divert our focus and attention away from uh, what is the most important. But at the end of the day, if we recognize what our unique ability is or what our superpower is, then you know maybe we just spend our time in that and the deals will come. And then we build the support systems around us. And you've done an incredible job of that. And so, you know, let's I wanted to move into that realm of how you stay focused, but then then so opportunistic in your real estate as you build your real estate empire. Yeah, Scott. You know what I've noticed is, and if it's okay if we if we go down this path is mm-hmm. and I 
great for your storage nation audience is through my own journey. And I've also been fortunate to coach thousands of people and speak on stages with amazing people like Barbara Corcoran and Kevin O'Leary and Jack Canfield and some of these amazing people. I've noticed that there's some traits that elite entrepreneurs and eight-figure, nine-figure investors have. These are the traits, Scott, that you possess, the traits that I possess, but also the traits that I see guys with really big portfolios who run a really good business and also have a lot of balance in their lives. You know, They have good family structure. They have good you know, relationship structure. They have good financial structure. There's really nine traits that I've recognized that these folks have. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to share those because I think your Storage Nation audience could really benefit from that. Absolutely. And then again, this is the reason I want to have you on and have this call when everybody else is uh, listening to uh, share a little bit about your journey and again, how you built what you built, because it is a little bit unique compared to some of the other guests we have and some of the other folks that uh, quite honestly that uh, that I deal with in my circles. Sure. Yeah, you bet. So I'm actually going to start because we've already touched base on it. I'm going to start with the 10th or the bonus trait which is the elite entrepreneurs that I've been around and the eight-figure, nine-figure investors that I've been around, they're super, super niche, right? You talk about focus, talk about niche. They have a superpower that they've recognized, whether it's finding deals, specifically finding self-storage deals or underwriting. Maybe it's raising capital. Maybe it's multifamily. Maybe it's in property management or asset management. But they have recognized that they're really good at one or two things, And they spend 80% of their time or more doing that one thing. And then that's what allows them to be attractive and attract other people, other partners or vendors or property managers or brokers to bring them deal flow, motivated sellers, because they can hang their hat on one super niche. So that was the that's the bonus trait. But I wanted to get that out of the way because I feel like if your audience really recognizes, you don't have to be the king of all things. You have to be just really, really super good at one or two things. And that will drive a very profitable long-term business. That is the bonus. Let me swing back now and talk about number one, Scott, which is the investors that I see that are really elite and that are eight, nine-figure guys, they invest for cash flow now. They would rather be a small investor than a big W-2 earner. Okay. A lot of people say, well, I want to be a big W-2 earner. I want to make a lot of money. And then I want to invest the difference. A lot of the guys that I've seen that are elite entrepreneurs today, they made the decision years ago to invest for cash flow now and be an investor, not an earner. That's the mistake I made when I had pancreatic cancer, Scott, is I didn't invest for cash flow now. I thought cash flow would come from flipping properties flipping buildings, flipping stuff. And then when you realize it's how transactional that is. So every elite entrepreneur that I know, whether it's self-storage, multifamily, whether it's an e-commerce business, whatever it is, is focused on cash flow today, not on equity later. You can't eat equity. Equity is great. It's a great balance sheet builder, but you can't eat it. What you can do is you can eat cash flow. So elite entrepreneurs invest for cash flow now. That's critical. Number two, this is so, so important, is that the elite entrepreneurs that I know, they've taken 100% responsibility for their life. They realize that no one is coming to their rescue. They realize that this world is this giant ocean of opportunity, and they're 100% accountable for themselves, their business, and that they're fortunate to design and build their own life. They think of that as the massive opportunity in the world where other people who are not elite entrepreneurs or not eight-figure to nine-figure investors, they're waiting for somebody else to give them an opportunity. They're waiting for somebody else to hand them a chance versus the elite entrepreneurs, Scott, that you and I know, Mm -hmm. they've said, I'm going to go make this happen for me. I'm going to take 100% responsibility for myself And I am the one who can go out and design and build my own life. And then they do. They have this vision for it. And they use self-storage or they use multifamily or they use whatever their money-making strategy is. To That's the tool that allows them to create this lifestyle that they want. But they don't make excuses. They're 100% they know they're 100% responsible for this life that they're trying to build. And that is something that I'm sure you are as well, Josh, um, that we've been speaking into our kids' lives. And, you know, first of all, you know what? Nobody owes you anything. 
You know, let, let's make that clear right now. Nobody owes you anything. And uh, if you go into life with that mindset, uh, you also recognize that if there's something out there that you do want, then you have to own it every step of the way and be responsible for everything. And so that's why, as I begin to talk about, you know, Jocko Willink and, you know, uh, some of the other folks that are now gaining uh, attention um, because they come with a level of accountability in their lives where you, you can absolutely plot the steps to success. And it's because it all comes back to them. They are not a victim. Nothing is anybody else's fault everything falls on them. And so, you know, we talk about that in, in my circles and with the folks that are on this podcast and especially our kids. And I think if we continue to beat that drum, then I think we're going to see a more responsible investment community out there as well. Would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. And look, when I had pancreatic cancer, I could have easily said, oh, woe was me. I'm the victim. I'm 35 years old. This should have never happened. I took a totally different approach. And this was, I got a lot of encouragement from my dad. And my dad said to me, my dad was also an entrepreneur. My dad said, look, this is going to be a journey. If you survive this, because remember back then pancreatic cancer only had a 7% survival rate, right? So there's a very big chance that I might not even make it. But my dad would tell me over and over, son, this is going to be a journey. Pay attention to the lessons you're learning along the way. You are responsible for your body. You are responsible for your life. This is something that you can learn from. And on the other end of it, you're going to have a whole nother chance, you know, a whole second chance in your life. What are you going to do with it? Right. Elite entrepreneurs think that way, not just think with pancreatic cancer, but when there's a deal that they thought they were going to get that they don't win, they don't get awarded that deal. When the, a motivated seller says, Hey, I'm going to sell you this self storage building. And then the self, they, they back out. What can I have learned from that? I'm responsible for that. That's a trait of an elite entrepreneur. The third one, Scott, and this is so basic, but it's so critical because elite entrepreneurs have super duper time management skills and not just them but they instill super time management skills in their whole organization. Okay. So you and I are big fans of Dan Sullivan. You and I both studied Dan Sullivan for years and years and years. He's got something called the personal economic system that he talks about free days, focus days, and buffer days. And that's a big part of how I still treat myself and my schedule. But all the elite entrepreneurs that I know, they're not ping-ponging around their week and their month. They're, They're very structured. We call it our meeting cadence within our business because we want certain meetings to lead into the next meeting or certain underwriting to lead into the next deal. And so I use Sunday nights. Sunday nights are so critical for me to post and prioritize my next week. And then when I look at everything that's important, similar to Brian Tracy, what Brian Tracy talked about in the book, Eat That Frog, you know that if you've got all these priorities and all the things you want to do, that you can't get them all done. So you pick the top things, the top 20% that's most important, and you schedule it in. But you have to do the same thing for your whole organization. You have to begin coaching your staff, your assistant, your acquisitions manager, the people that are responsible for raising capital, and help them structure up their week so the whole organization is working in the same cadence. An elite entrepreneur is not only good with time management skills of their own, managing whether it's a, a spouse, kids, whatever, but they're really good at forming up and managing their team. That is a trait that an elite entrepreneur has. And this this goes into number four. The fourth trait of an elite entrepreneur is they refuse leeches. They refuse leeches. So in every business and in every point's personal life, leeches are things that suck time away that provide little or no value. Okay. So it could be social media. It could be a board that you're on, a board that, you know, some school or some organization, maybe it's a homeowners association board that you get no value from. My dad told me one time he was on the board at my former high school, private Catholic Franciscan school. My dad, I graduated. He decided to go on the board. He's like, Josh, for 18 months, nothing changed. So I quit the board, right? That's a leech that's taking time away from you. Somebody who is, toxic, somebody who's negative, an organization that's providing no value, meetings with people, these, hey, do you have five minutes? You got five minute meetings? No, that's a leech, right? The guy that says, hey, can, can, can I take you out for coffee? I just want to pick your brain. That's a leech, right? If it doesn't have an agenda, it doesn't matter in my world. And this whole idea of all this technology, right? Technology is great. It makes our life so much easier. but 
technology, as we all know, Scott gives off these endorphins in our brains. Every time there's a like, every time there's a comment, every time there's a new follower, it gives off this chemical in our brain, this endorphin that says this dopamine that gives us this happy like feeling about ourselves. But is social media really serving us? If we're not using it purposely, it becomes a leech. It's just taking time away where we could be going to find a new deal, acquire a new self-storage building or a multifamily property, raise more capital. We feel like, oh, because we checked Facebook, we were working. No, that's a leech all day. So elite entrepreneurs, what I've seen them do, and one of the things that I do is I use the app or use the technology when I need it, and then I delete the app from my phone so it's not in front of me. So that dopamine rush that I get by checking it is removed from my day-to-day life. This, this falls in with number three, which is the super time management skills. If I'm constantly letting these leeches pop into my life, my super time management skills are dissipating and it's not working. Okay. Which leads me to number five, Scott, which is elite entrepreneurs and elite investors use technology as a weapon. Okay. So we use lots of technology. Infusionsoft for marketing funnels. We use Builder Trend for our capital improvement progress. We use a, a program called Happy Co for due diligence. We use Appfolio for property management and investor management. We use Basecamp for project management. They all have apps that I can check from my phone in the field. But we tell our team if it's not in the software, it didn't happen. Okay. If it's not in the software, it didn't happen because when you build a big portfolio, Scott, like your self storage portfolio, I own 4,300 units of apartments. We've done 18 syndications. You can't do that if you're relying on email, text messages, meetings, one on one talks with your team. It's got to go into the software so everybody can reference it. That's what makes your company scalable. If you're relying on meetings, you're dead meat. If you're using technology as a weapon where you can get reports out of technology, you can put all your meeting notes in technology, you can upload photos, pictures, underwrites into a software program that somebody else can then download, it eliminates the need for meetings. So using technology is critical. And every elite entrepreneur I know demands that their team uses technology. But as we know, technology is very tough to adopt, right? So... One of the strategies here is to just pick out 10 to 20% of any technology that your company is going to onboard and be firmly and completely committed to just using 10 or 20% of it. And then your team will slowly begin to adopt more and more of it. So Scott, I know you guys use technology in your business, right? As not only for marketing, but for self-storage management, it's critical to scaling a company. Yeah, absolutely. And we stress that a lot. And and I have to have constant reminders in our level 10 meetings. To your point, Josh, uh, if it's not in the app, if it's not in the technology, then it didn't happen. It operates in a vacuum because we operate as a team. And um, it's the same as you, we're a fast moving company and uh, we don't have time for meetings and we don't have time for one-offs to get everybody up to speed. So it, uh, it has to happen on a common platform or it just doesn't get done. That's right. And for us, like we have a weekly owner meeting with different property, we have four different property managers that work for us. We have a different owner meeting every week, once a month with these different property managers. That's part of the meeting cadence I mentioned in, in, in number three. And the software allows us to then guide the meeting, right? So it's really, really important. Uh, Scott, listen, moving on to number six, every elite entrepreneur that I know has a clear end result that they're pursuing. I have a specific exercise that I use called ACER, A-C-E-R, absolute clarity of the end result, A-C-E-R. And we have one for business and we have one for our personal lives. But in business, my goal has never been, we're going to own 10,000 units. My goal is very annual. I want to own and buy 950 additional units per year because that 950 When they're stabilized and we stabilize them and we're able to get them to market value rent and market stabilization value, we know that each unit produces about $1,350 to $1,400 of net free cash flow per year. So you take the 950 times about 1,400 bucks, that's $1.2 million a year of net free, spendable, distributable cash flow. It's $100,000 a month. 
So I thought, look, what if we could just continue to buy enough properties and enough buildings or enough self-storage, Scott, in your case, that you could add $100,000 a month of net free cash flow after all your expenses are paid, after all your team is paid, after all your debt service is paid. So that's my ACER. That's my end result that I'm pursuing. It doesn't mean it's right for everybody. There's guys way bigger than me. There's guys way smaller than me. But that's the end result that my company is pursuing because that gives us the net free cash flow to distribute out to myself and my two business partners. That's the net free dollars for us, right? So we have an ACER that we're working towards that we know that we talk about all the time and we set goals that way. It's really, really important. And a lot of entrepreneurs are like, I just want to make a lot of money. That will never serve you. That will never get you where you want to go. Right. So Scott, I'm sure in your business, you, people that you coach, people on this podcast, you encourage them to like, some people call it a vision board, a dream board, those kind of things. To us, it's just 950 units a year. That's our yeah. company goal. The opposite of that to make a whole lot of money is hoping. And as uh, we say around here, hope is not a strategy. And so, uh, yeah, we we talk a lot about, you know, the opportunities that come on our desk are, are only opportunities until they become a deal. And then uh, when they become a deal, what are we going to do with it? Well, the first question we ask is, well, well what's our exit strategy? And if it's um, is to sell in five years or it's to keep it, then if we keep it, does it make sense to do so? And is that working towards the big goal? And that is the cash flow goal that you just mentioned. And so, yeah, same decision board and decision making uh, process that we uh, that we work through. Um, but if you don't have a plan for the empire, then you won't know if you've arrived or if you've gone up in a different direction. Or in many cases, you end up with a portfolio or a business that is running you instead of you running the business. Yeah, that's absolutely right. It's funny you said the plan for the empire, right? Because we talk about that same strategy, but I'm a huge Star Wars geek. Like I love Star Wars. And every time I think about the empire, right, their plan was just to build the biggest planet killer in the world and own the universe. Like if that's your plan, that's probably not good, but good versus evil. Star Wars did a good job with that. If that's your plan, then cast that vision to everybody and know exactly where you're going to go, right? That's fantastic. So number seven, Scott, is elite entrepreneurs are able to scale what I call the one to many concept, right? They're able to teach and speak one person in front of many, many, many people. This podcast of yours, Scott, super successful, is an example of this. You host and talk to one guest, me, and all your other guests, and you're able to speak and get this vision, this these concepts, marketing ideas, acquisitions ideas, private capital ideas, ideas about your life and your business, coaching people. You're able to record it once and get it out to thousands and thousands and thousands of people all from that one effort. This one hour that we're going to record is going to get listened to by thousands and thousands and thousands of people. So elite entrepreneurs don't hide and say, well, I'm going to build this big business by myself, or I'm going to build this big business alone, or I'm going to do it from my computer. I'm going to do it in front of large groups. I'm going to cast my message to lots and lots of people. And then they're able to bring people in through whether it's a marketing funnel or an opt-in page or some sort of way that they capture people. And then those people become their closer circle, their closer crowd. They can kind of build a tribe with, like you said, storage nation. This is what it's all about. But every elite entrepreneur I know has done something similar. They've scaled this one-to-many process through webinars, podcasts, email marketing, YouTube videos. That is a critical way for one person to have a big impact on a lot of people. Next, Scott, number eight. Listen, this is so critical. Service. Every elite entrepreneur I met believes in this. Number eight, service trumps price. White glove service for your staff and for your, whether it's your residents, whether it's the people who, you know, lease your self storage units, whatever you're selling, service trumps price. Look, the Ritz Carlton charges in some cases $1,000 a night or more for a hotel room. They have the same kind of building, roughly the same size hotel unit. But the service of a Ritz is what allows them to charge a thousand a night in Naples, Florida, versus the Marriott down the street that charges two fifty or three hundred bucks a night. It's the experience. So every elite entrepreneur that I know believes that service 
taking care of as a property manager, taking care of the residents, the people, the clients that use your service, whether they lease a self-storage unit or a multifamily unit, whatever it is, they know that the way that they talk, the way that they act, the way that they welcome their clients, the contracts that they use, the software that they use, the ease of business, service trumps price. And if you have amazing service, you can simply charge more. See, in my business, Scott, after being an entrepreneur for over 25 years, I either want to be the most expensive or the cheapest. I never want to be right in the middle, right? So when we underwrite a deal, I look at the median. Of course, I look at the average square foot price per foot of something that we're going to lease. But I'm like, look, once we do our value add program, I want to be way north of the median, way north of the average. I want to be one of the most expensive, but I want to be, I want to buy it for the cheapest, but I want to release it out for the most because we're going to have incredible service that's going to take care of our people. Scott, as you know, how many, how many self-storage buildings have you bought or your members bought where the only reason why you bought it at a discount is because the management was horrible? A lot. That's what we are always seeking is that is where the value is added. If you can't find a piece of dirt to build a building and then put an income stream on it, the next best thing to add value is to buy an underperforming facility. And there's where the value is created because somebody didn't keep up with the technology or the rents or marketing. And they're just a manager, not necessarily a salesperson and somebody who's wanting to make a great experience for their customer. It it is about the service, 100%. No doubt. And using technology, going back to number five, using technology as a weapon to allow yourself to communicate with your residents, your clients, letting them submit maintenance tickets and inquiries and pay their rent online, all these different kinds of things as part of that white glove service. If you're not doing that, you're completely missing out. But then like a little bit of the extra stuff, right? Making your clients understand and feel special, great marketing collateral, great brochures, you know, great experience when they walk into the management office, you know, your property manager knowing your residents or clients on a first name basis. These are little things that to show and demonstrate this kind of you know white glove service, the service trumps price. That's easy. It just takes the extra effort. It doesn't take any extra training or money. It's just the mentality of the business. So as the CEO, elite entrepreneurs, they, they make this permeate throughout their whole company. It's not just them being great white glove, but teaching the rest of their staff to offer the same kind of thing. And finally, Scott, number nine is that elite entrepreneurs realize It's not about the building that you bought. It's not about the self-storage building that you bought or the multifamily building that you bought. It's all about the people. Elite entrepreneurs know that the business, the business of running a business is the people. You've got to get the people right. Train the people, treat the people professionally. Look, you could have all the technology in the world, all the systems in the world, billing, maintenance tickets, all kinds of analytics and KPIs, but the people have to run the technology. The people have to run the systems. Even Uber, right, which came and completely disrupted the taxi business without drivers, without customers riding in the cars, or without the driver driving to Uber, Uber's not worth whatever it's worth today, billions and $100 billion. It's about the people Right. So every elite entrepreneur and big investor knows that there's going to be two different kinds of levels here. There's going to be people that kind of operate in the clouds that have to be able to be outside the business, slightly above the business, looking down on the business. And then there's the people that are operating the business every day in the dirt. Okay. The people that are doing the business every day, the people that are leasing out units, the people that are greeting customers, the people that are working on maintenance tickets the people that are doing acquisitions, the brokers that you're dealing with when you're buying in the next building. It's all about those people that are operating in the dirt. So if you're a CEO or you're an elite entrepreneur and you're leading an organization that's buying self-storage or buying multifamily, your number one goal is to make the business for the people in the dirt, make their job as easy as possible. Make their job frictionless as possible. It's not, hey, I'm the CEO. I get to drive a Bentley and go to the Cavs games and sit in the front row and I'm worth you know $20 million. I have this huge balance sheet, whatever. No, I may have all that, but only because I've tried to make the job of the people in the dirt 
is easy and as frictionless as possible. So I can be above it and see it. And then I help them because they're down in the dirt doing it. And they have to have this, what I call mutual respect, Scott, this idea of the people in the clouds have to have mutual respect for the people in the dirt and vice versa so that I can help them do a better job. And I can see all the numbers and all the analytics that helps me make decisions. I freak out on data as an elite entrepreneur, as a CEO, I got to have data, but then I've got to take that data and show how can we make this job easier for the people actually running the company. That's what an elite entrepreneur does. That's how you become an eight-figure investor. Use these nine traits because these are the things I've seen in hundreds of elite entrepreneurs, plus the bonus one, Scott, which is being super niche. We talked about that first. You take those 10 traits, these 10 things, that's what's going to allow you to become an eight or a nine-figure investor. It's not the reverse. You don't become an eight-figure, nine-figure investor and then have these traits. You have the traits first. That's what allows you to become a massively successful investor. Does that, does that make sense, Scott? Is that helpful? hundred percent. And another way to look at it, we continue to make business so complicated. And I, I, you watch so many people that just uh, fumble over themselves and it, and it really is the basics. There's a lot of basics, but it, it still comes down to the basics. If I look at my journey and if a knucklehead like me can get to the place where I am right now, it's because uh, of a lot of lumps along the way. And it is the people. It truly is. And this isn't Dan Sullivan fan show podcast, but you know, going back to his most recent book, which is a uh, who, not how. And you know, we sit there and always say, well, how am I going to do this? And how am I going to find enough time to do this? And nobody will be able to do this as well as I am. And so I just need to do it and it doesn't get done. And the successful business owner says, all right, well, here's what needs to be done. Yeah, I know how to do it, but I'm not the one to do it because I need to be delegating. And, and here's my unique ability, as we talked about. You know, I need to spend my 80% of my time in my superpower. And so I need to find the who that is going to handle this. And so, you know, we go back to then Jim Collins. And, um, you know, as we evolve as business owners, first of all, you know, Michael Gerber, you know, systems run the business and we manage and tweak the system. And you put people in and you take them out as like a franchise. And and that was my approach to to people in the beginning. And then, you know, along comes Jim Collins and he, and he talks with, uh, you know, the good to great about, you know, getting the right people on the right seats on the bus. So again, I, hard lessons I had to learn and recognize that, you know what, you can't just hire somebody and expect them to, to do that job without guiding them and, and having them understand who you are, what's expected of them, and really what the company is all about and their core values and hiring based upon core values. And then to your point now, you have to make sure that you are leaning into these folks and you have to, that doesn't mean just now, okay, I got the right person and the right seat on the bus and I'm giving them a process checklist. Well, you need to train these people. You know, delegation doesn't uh, mean you, you, you point over there and tell them to go do this. It means that um, you need to make their job as frictionless as possible, which means that you need to invest in them, not just train right. them. You need to invest in them. That's not the secrets, but when it comes to people, that is the only way that your company is going to grow or get to the level that you want is with the people. But that means that you need to have an active role. And going back to where we started on all this, Josh, is that you need to be responsible and you can't lay blame and say, well, I heard all these good people and nothing happened. That lies on you. You have to build that framework and you have to lean into those folks and train them to make their job as frictionless as possible. And then you have a business that is running on all cylinders. Yeah, absolutely. There's another method, Scott, that we use to kind of get into the dirt. We call it the torque method right? T-O-R-C, which in my world stands for threat of review check-in. <laughs> you think of torque, you think of like a Porsche and the torque just makes that thing go yeah. zero miles an hour, three seconds, but threat of review check-in. So with all of our staff, we have conversation with their review and say, look, this is what we're tasking you to do mm -hmm. for the next three months or six months or a year. Can you do this? What tools do you need to do this? But this is what the company, this is not what Josh Cantwell needs. This is what the company needs from you in your swim lane for mm -hmm. the company to be successful. Can you do this? Mm -hmm. And yes. So then I tell my people, listen, if you can't do this, this is what I'm expecting of you. Okay. So review goals. But if you can't do this, I don't want to find out 12 months from now that we're coming right. to do your review, mm -hmm. review check-in, and you're missing on these because something the company didn't provide you, some excuse, some reason that you said, well, it's not my fault. If you mm -hmm. accomplish it or not, going back to number two, elite entrepreneurs take 100% responsibility for their life, right? And you want that same yep. mentality in your people that work with you, that work on your team. So like, look, next year at this time when we meet, this is the specific goal. And so if you don't meet this goal, 
you can't expect raise, positive review, bonuses, blah, blah, blah. If you hit the goal, then you can expect X, X amount of review, X amount of increase in your pay, X amount of bonus. If you well exceed this goal, then you can expect a possible change in title, a raise in base salary, more bonus, more free time, more time off. So they know you either hit the goal. If you don't, here's the result. If you well exceed it, here's the result. So this review check-in that you're going to have, we set that expectation up front. Mm -hmm. So if you're a property manager or an asset manager, or you're in capital improvements, or you raise capital for us for our deals, this is the expectation, right? And if you're not going to hit these, there has to be a really good company reason why. I'll give you an example. One of our people is Jen Pennington. Jen is responsible. She's our director of operations and investor relations. She's tasked with helping me raise 20 million bucks a year. Okay. Mm -hmm. The $20 million correlates with the 950 units that we want to buy. Mm -hmm. So that those go hand in hand. So last year, we well ex exceeded the 950 units, but we actually under raised on the 20 million. So when we had her review check in, she's like, well, we didn't raise the 20 million, but Josh was here's why. And really, the reason was we didn't need it, right? We didn't have the, the next deal mm -hmm. to do that. So she hit the goal for what she was tasked to do. And really successful people, again, they hire the right people, you review mm -hmm. with them, you set them a goal, then you turn them loose for 90 days and let them go and make it happen, right? A really high level goal and let them go. They come back, check in 90 days later and say, here, I'm on pace to do this, this, and this, but I'm short of this goal. Okay, what do you need? Remember the annual goal, the review check-in. How can we help you hit that goal? That's what we need from you. And then they go 90 days later. We've got to hire really good people and let them go. Let them execute. If you're checking in with your people every day, they're not the right people and you're maybe the not manager either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it requires a level of self-awareness on, on both ends. Um, you know, Checking in myself as the CEO and uh, either the hiring person or the managing person over our site you know, do I have the capacity and do I have the skill set to be able to give this person what, the, what they need? And does this person have the capacity and the desire to achieve with what we've outlined in this in this position? And I think uh, both folks need to have a, an understanding of uh, what is needed in order for this uh, to work in every position it, it does take to. Josh, thanks so much for the nine. So much more than we can unpack here. And this in our time left, I wanted to pivot for a minute if I could, if you're willing to answer this. And that is, you mentioned, and I wasn't aware of this, and you mentioned it almost in passing as if everybody here knew that pancreatic cancer survival rate is only 7%. Going into that, first of all, you know, anytime you get a, a prognosis like the one that you had, you know, there's, there's a whole flood of emotions that comes in. But then as you dug in or when the news was delivered to you that, hey, there's probably, you know, there's a darn good chance that I'm not going to make it through this. From that time to, you know, getting through, you know, on the backside of it, there's a whole lot of lessons that I'm sure that were learned about life and about yourself. Um, could you just take a few minutes to unpack that if you're willing? Sure. You know, look, I, I think the diagnosis to me was devastating. I didn't know that when I went in and met with my doctor and explained, I felt this giant lump on the left side of my stomach. And then he ordered a CT scan. I got the CT scan down on a Saturday morning. And the hospital called me Monday morning at eight o'clock, right when they opened and said, Josh, you have to come to the hospital immediately. I looked over at my wife almost jokingly and said, well, that ain't good. You know, I was 35. I had two kids. My wife was eight months pregnant with our third when all this was happening. And I later found out that the survival, my doctor didn't come to me and say, Josh, the survival rate's only seven, eight, 9%. Essentially what he did tell me though, is Josh, you have the same exact diagnosis as Steve Jobs from Apple computer when he had just passed away from it. And so I started thinking, okay, I remember there was one night, Scott, that I went up to my master bedroom and cried. I let my, I just let it all come out one night. And the next day I woke up and I started thinking, okay, well, what can I do? Again, taking a hundred percent responsibility for my life. Number two, what can I do? Who can I talk to? So I started calling people that I knew that had cancer in the past, started calling people that I knew that had pancreatic cancer in the past. I started having very serious conversations with my wife, getting my financial house in order, talking with my parents, these kind of things. And I think when I met my surgeon is really when it hit me. When I had to sign the digital disclosure and acceptance that they might have to take out my stomach 
my gallbladder, my spleen, all of my liver, all of my pancreas, all of my stomach. They might have to reconstruct the veins in my liver. They might have to reconstruct and connect my esophagus right to my small intestine and remove my stomach altogether. That's when it just hit me like a ton of bricks because I envisioned all of this happening. And I remember talking to my wife the night before, there were two things that happened the night before the surgery. One of my buddies, you know, actually used a Top Gun, Top Gun reference. And he called me up and said, look, Josh, you know, tomorrow's, I'm going to get a little caught up here, but I know tomorrow's a big day, but he says to me, he's like, it's just a walk in the park, Kazansky, right? You remember that from the original Top Gun? So I'll never forget that. My friend, Mike Tutron called me. He said like, like, dude, you got this, like you're healthy. Other than this thing in your body, you're built for this surgery. You can handle it. But then I looked at my wife later on that night and I said, look, honey, if I don't make it, it's going to be okay. If I don't make it through the surgery, it's going to be okay. Like we've got all of our financial houses in order. Like I'd want to be here, but if this is what's been planned for me, I'm okay with this. This is now out of my control. So even though one of the the traits is that you take 100% responsibility for your life, you also have to realize at certain moments and so much of life is out of your control. There's so many other people making decisions and things are happening and people making bad decisions. You can't control that, but you can only control how you react to it. Okay. So that I think is the big lesson that I learned is that I didn't have a lot of control over getting cancer. Like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think I ate wrong or my, my lifestyle was bad. And I, I did this to myself, but I got it. It just is what it is. And it was out of my control. But what I can control is my reaction to it. And how was I going to approach people? How was I going to talk to people? Was I going to, was I going to be around everybody else in my life and make them feel bad that I might die? Or was I going to make the absolute most of it that I could for those couple of weeks, months up until the surgery? You know, I was so fortunate, Scott, that the doctor on the operating table, Dr. Matthew Walsh, he performed a life-saving surgery, 10 hours. He took my gallbladder, my spleen, my entire stomach, most of my liver, most of my pancreas. He had to reconstruct the arteries behind my pancreas and liver that were crushed by the cancer. The cancer mask was the size of a basketball, Scott. It was bigger than your head in my stomach, but he got it all out on the operating table. And I was so fortunate that it did not metastasize like Steve Jobs. It did not get into my bloodstream and move all over my body. But the cancer mask was so big, he had to take it all out. He got it all out. But then I had to relearn how to eat. Like I had no stomach, right? So it took me six months to keep food down. I lost 50 pounds. To give you an idea, Scott, the surgery was just so radical. As you and I sit here today, we each have seven units of blood in our entire body. Okay. They measure this by units, they call it. Seven units of blood in your entire body. On the operating table that day, they put 21 units of blood in my body that day. They cycled through 21 in 10 hours. So you realize after all that, I was spared for a reason. I was given a second chance. And now I realize I have an obligation, like a moral obligation to other people who are less fortunate than me or my staff members that maybe don't have the guts or the risk taking that I have. Now I do everything that I do for these other people because I really shouldn't even be here. Right. So now my motivation is not selfish at all. It's totally selfless, frankly, to help take care of other people with this second half of my life because I had no control over that 10 hour surgery. That was 100% in God's hands and Dr. Matthew Walsh's hands, the surgeon's hands, the team. Otherwise, all I did was lay there, right? That day I did nothing. So it's so much to talk about there, but that, that's just some of the things that happened and some of the things that were on my mind and some of the things I think about today, kind of reflecting back. Mm-hmm. Well, I appreciate you sharing. And I think uh, Storage Nation uh, and we can all learn a little bit uh, from that uh, as well. And you don't go through something like that, uh, being a changed man when you come out on the other side. So once again, I appreciate you you sharing that. And um, my friend, uh, God uh, has definitely spared you for a time such as this to be able to go out and um, share what you're sharing right now and uh, to be a light for others, but then also to build an incredible organization so that those people can catch a little bit of what you've got, Josh. So I'm thankful that we were able to share in that as well. And I just appreciate your time today. Absolutely, Scott. Thanks so much for having me on, man. It's great to know you for such a long time and to share personal strategies, business strategies. So thanks, Elaine, for having me on. I appreciate it a lot. 
Uh, Josh, if uh, somebody wants to follow a little bit more about uh, what you're doing, uh, what's the best way for them to be able to reach out and find you? Yeah. Um, so I'm very active on LinkedIn and our main website is freelandventures.com. There you'll see everything from my personal story, our portfolio, everything that we do is at freelandventures.com. Beautiful. Josh, thanks so much for your time once again. And I look forward to the time when you and I can be in the same room again uh, together and hope that's uh, very soon. Yeah, me too, Scott. Thanks so much. All right. Take care, my friend. Hey, gang, wait three things before you leave. First, don't forget to subscribe to the Self Storage Podcast and turn on your notifications so you never miss another episode. And while you're there, please leave us a five-star review if you like the show. Second, be sure to share your favorite episodes and more via Instagram, and don't forget to tag us. And lastly, head to the links in the show description and hit the follow and subscribe button on Twitter and Facebook to get a front-row seat as we grow and scale our business and bring you along with us. Take care.